we just read about uh, Barnabas, the good giver, and now we're going to read about Ananias and Sapphira. How do you like the fact that I was able to get their picture? Are you pretty impressed with that? <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good one, that the picture of them. That's probably what they looked similar to, anyway, at the time. Um, so Ananias and Sapphira, they are, that's their Greek names. I put on, your, on their picture, I put their Hebrew names for you and what they mean just so that you'll have that for information. Um, the reason why I always like to do that is because you know, of course, that the um, New Testament was written in Greek, but it was um, the, the people thought in Hebrew and all had Hebrew names. We're, we get to learn their Greek names, but they all had Hebrew names. And so don't, don't misinterpret the fact these are Jewish people and they, are, um, they are, have become believers in Messiah and have bought into the, uh, this whole theology of selling everything that you have and waiting for Jesus to come back, only they make a mistake. So let's talk about what they do. So there was a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, and he sold a possession. Uh, I read in the um, New King James Version, so it's always a little bit different, but um, we're just going to go back over that chapter again and, um, and, and study it now verse by verse. So um, they sold a possession, so they've now got some money, and he, Ananias, kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, okay? So she's complicit in what's going on, and brought a certain part, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. I like the fact that he uses the exact same thing that he uses with Barnabas up in the, in the top verse. It, Barnabas laid it at the apostles' feet. What are they doing? They're acknowledging the power and authority of the apostles to take whatever they give them and use it however it needs to be done. They're, they're acknowledging that. So it's the exact same process. Sell it, get the money, take it up, lay it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas is given high praise for what it is that he does. They do the exact same thing, but they're not given high praise. Why? He kept back part of the proceeds. Oh, sorry. And his wife being aware of it, they laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? All right, so... Who is he saying uh, took control of the situation for Ananias? Satan filled his heart. So Satan filled his heart and, and created this um, desire for sin. Was Ananias helpless because Satan filled his heart? No, he still has a choice, doesn't he? Do you go with it or not? Do you, when we're tempted, we still have that choice. Do we, do we, do we sin? Or do we choose not to sin? And so Ananias always had the ability to say, no, this is not right, even though this plan had been hatched in his heart. And so lying to the Holy Spirit is the sin that he is being accused of. And so Peter tells him, while it remained, was it not your own? This has always been your land, Ananias. And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. And so he's saying, oh, it, it was, you didn't have to sell it. And then when you sold it, you could have given any portion of it you wanted. You could have come and said, we'd like to give you half of what we, we earned. That would have been totally acceptable. That There is no reason. Why would they have lied about it? Why do you think they wanted it to look this way? Okay, because everyone around them sees it and says, wow. Oh, they're giving all of their money to, to that. Isn't that really something? So they're wanting to, to appear as though they're doing something really amazing here, which giving half of their money would have been amazing enough, right? And so um, he's saying, he's saying you ha there is no reason for this sin to have occurred. You've lied to men. You have not only lied to men, but you've lied to God. Now, earlier he says you've lied to who? The Holy Spirit. And now he says, you've lied to God. This is a beautiful example of it being a unity. Uh, it, you know, that, that, tr that trinity. When you lie to God, you're lying to the entirety of the trinity. When you lie to the Holy Spirit or blaspheming the Holy Spirit, as they did in the Gospels, when 
when Jesus, they uh, told Jesus that he was healing by the power of Beelzebub. And he goes, you have, every sin can be forgiven except for the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. Because they had said that it was by the power of the Holy Spirit he was healing. Um, his wife could have stopped too. His wife could have stopped too. Absolutely, because she's complicit. She knows what's going on. And so, so when you blaspheme against God, you're also blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, and the same true with this. It shows that closeness of how you cannot harm one without harming the other in that, uh, in that trinity. So when Ananias, hear, oh, then Ananias, hearing these words, what words? You have lied to God, fell down and breathed his last. That's an interesting um, statement to say, breathed his last. If you read it in the original Greek, it actually says he was, let me write it down. He was S-O-U-L-E-D, sold out. His soul went out of him. The reason why that's so interesting is because in, back in the Bible, uh, in uh, Genesis, when Adam is created, that he, it says he breathed into him the breath of life. Well, it's that word that's used for the Holy Spirit, ruach, the breath of God breathed in. That soul of God comes from the breath of God, from the Holy Spirit. So when he died, his soul came out. And it actually means he was sold out, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all of those who heard these things. Who would be the ones who would be so fearful? All the people that were sitting around and seeing this, all the ones who had given their possessions or were part of that group who were receiving possessions, all of them saw this and went, oh, wow. Oh, wow, this is a big deal. Now, this seems to be a little bit of a hardcore discipline for what he had done to, 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 to die out. I, I left a chapter in your packet that you can read um, this next week. It's from Joshua 7, and it's the story of a man named Achan. And the reason why I'm going to pull him out is because it's the same type of story. Joshua and the Israelites have come into the land of Canaan, brand new. They're going to go around Jericho. Remember seven times around Jericho, and then the walls come tumbling down. So they're going to go around Jericho, and God tells them, everything that's in Jericho is mine. It's consecrated to me. You are not to take anything out of Jericho. It's interesting because Jericho is the first city, and the first always goes to God. And so that's his. That's, that's his. And he says, don't you take anything. Well, Achan goes in, and he takes some gold and silver and uh, a robe. And he takes it, and he hides it in his, in his tent. And when Achan does that, um, Israel begins to fail in their military actions. They begin to get beaten. And so Joshua falls on his face and he goes, Lord, what's going on? You had promised us that you were going to help us clean out this land. What's going on? And God says, you have sin in your camp. Someone has done what it is that I told them not to do. And so they bring him in tribe by tribe, family by family, and the long story short, they, they get to Achan. And... And Achan finally fesses up, and he says, I took gold and silver, and I hid it in the floor of my tent, along with a beautiful robe. And so God says, have him bring the gold and the silver to the camp. You are to stone him, his family, his children, all of his livestock, everything that he owns. You are to stone them, kill them, and burn their bodies. It's really, really severe. And there are other things that are going to happen later on that are far worse than that, and they don't get that kind of treatment. But why? Why so severe? Because they're beginning a brand new thing, and God needs to make a point. This is a new time frame that God is leading them to. So this dispensation of, the, of them coming in, this time frame of them coming in to the land of Canaan, he needed to make a big point. And Achan, and the story of Achan is that big point. The same thing was true with, um, with uh, Aaron's two sons. They bring in a fire in, and God slays them because it, it, was, uh, it was not the fire they were supposed to bring in. Far worse things are going to happen. The priests are going to do far worse things, and they don't get killed. But God needed to make a point because that was the first. It was the beginning of a new dispensation for priests. 
This thing with Ananias and Sapphira, this is the beginning of the church. This is the foundation of the church. It cannot be based on a lie. And so God's punishment to Ananias and Sapphira seems very severe to us. And we're going to see people who do worse things later on in, in this book. And they don't get killed. But in this case, it's the beginning of a new thing. And when that happens over and over and over, you see God being very harsh because it cannot start with a foundation of a lie. Discipline must start within the church early on. And so that's what happens here. So uh, that's why this great fear came up on all those who heard the things. That's exactly what God intended to happen. Now, the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out, and they buried him because in Jewish law, you don't leave a body overnight. And so they buried him that day. Now, about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, she doesn't even know she's a widow at that point, not knowing what had happened. And Peter says, hey, tell me whether you sold your land for so much. So he's giving her an opportunity. Is this true? Did you sell it for this? And she goes, oh, yes, yes for that much. Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together with her husband to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out too. Those poor young men, they had just gone out and buried Ananias and here Sapphira dies. And so they wrap her up, they take her out and immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last or was sold out. And the young men came, found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all of the church and upon all of those who heard those things. So that's the point of this. Nobody else is going to do that. This is the first time you're going to see in the book of Acts the term church used. It's ecclesia in the Greek. In, uh, it's the Hebrew word for congregation. And it's going to be the, prefer the preferred word used for, uh, from here on out for this group of people. The church, the ecclesia, the congregation of people. Now, um, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch or portico. So through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done. At this point, we're not seeing anyone else of the other believers given this power, right? This is the power of the apostles to go out and heal at this point. And why are they healing? This is just a repeat question. To authenticate the message. That's the purpose of the healing. To authenticate the message of Jesus. And where are they healing? They're healing at the temple in Solomon's porch. That area in two chapters ago, you, I gave you a picture of it, what it looks like to, you know, uh, what it would have looked like, where they would have met and taught. So they're on the Temple Mount doing this. Why? Because they're only teaching Jews at this point. They ha it hasn't gone out into the rest of the city. These are Jews that they're teaching. So uh, yet none of the rest dare join them but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So our church, the church is growing. The ecclesia is growing. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. Here's an interesting thing. That at least the shadow of Peter passing by could fall on some of them. So how amazing is that, that Peter has been given such power and authority as he goes out and takes the keys and opens the kingdom up to the Jewish people that even his shadow would heal the sick. It doesn't say the rest of the apostles had that, so I can't tell you that they have it. But Peter does, because Peter is the leader. Is that something that you ever see today? No. No. You don't see that today. <clears throat> Also, I'm in verse 16, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. And so they're healing both the physical needs of the people and the demonic spiritual uh, issues that are going on. Both of those are being healed, and it's saying everyone is being healed at that point. 
Verse 17, then the high priest, now it's probably talking about Annas, even though it could mean Caiaphas, but it's one of those, those Sadducees, rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, they were all filled with, there's several words, what does yours say? Jealousy. Jealousy. Indignation is what mine says. Jealousy of what was going on. Why are they jealous? Because uh, there's a lot of people that are beginning to believe what they're saying now about this Jesus. So they laid their hands on the apostles and they put them in the common prison. So not the, the temple prison that they had been put in earlier with the lame man, not the, to the, with the jail on the temple mount, but this is just the common one in Jerusalem that they get thrown in. But at night, so that night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And this angel of the Lord said, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the wor words of this life. And when they heard that, they, the apostles, entered the temple early in the morning and they taught, just like they had been doing all along. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together and all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them, or the apostles, brought. So they, they convene the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, and they say, okay, bring the prisoners. Bring the prisoners to us, because they don't know what's happened the night before. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and they reported saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards were standing on the outside of the doors. But when we opened them, there was no one in there. So this is a very polite angel because he locks the doors behind him. <laughs> After he opens the doors and lets them out, he relocks the doors. And the guards who apparently were put into some sort of supernatural stupor and don't know what's going on are standing there as if nothing has happened. They have no idea what God has done. And it's interesting to me, too, as we move along, you're never going to see this, the, the Sanhedrin or the Sadducees or the high priest. No one is ever going to say, how did you get out of jail? Nobody ever questions them. It's too hard for them to imagine. The doors are locked, the guards are there, and they're out of prison. What in the world has happened? They never even question them. So when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what would the outcome be of this. So one came and told them, saying, hey, look, those men that you put in prison, they're standing in the temple and they're preaching to the people. Then the captain with the officers brought them in without violence for they feared the people lest they be stoned. So we talked about the captain of the temple as the police, chief of the police, and he goes and he gets them. This time they're doing it gently. They're not really manhandling them because they're afraid that the people are gonna throw a stinking fit and stone them. So they're taking them in in a very careful way. And when they brought them and set them before the council, and the high priest asks them, saying, hey, did we not strictly command you not to teach in what? His name. Not Jesus, this man Jesus of Nazareth, not that, his name. But they're not going to say it. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. You're blaming us for this. Remember when we read in Matthew, what was it, uh, back in chapter, Matthew 27, 25, we read about when Jesus was being crucified, what did the people say? Let his blood be upon us and our children. That's what they said in Matthew 27. And now they're saying, hey, you're trying to put his blood on us. But you know what? You already asked for that earlier on. And uh, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I wonder if he said, sorry, sorry, we need to obey God. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, who you murdered by hanging on a tree. Interestingly, in Acts, the word for cross, S-T-A-U-R-O-S, -S, that's the word for cross, is never used. Okay, instead, lum, which is the word for tree or pole, is used in the book of Acts. And so they... They talk about the cross because of what it was. It was a tree that had been cut down. 
and used. One of the reasons why that, in your packet, you'll see that I gave you a copy of Deuteronomy 21 in your packet, and it says in that, in that section, if someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave that body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it the same day, because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse, and you must not desecrate the land which God gave you. It's this word, tree, pole. And so, so this, is the, this is the worst thing that can happen to a Jew. And so they don't use the word for cross, the Roman, the Roman uh, punishment. They use the word that's used in Deuteronomy that says it's the worst thing that can happen to you, the tree or the pole. And so that's what it's always called at that point. And so they said, uh, you, you hung him on a tree, and him God has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior. Why? Why did God do all of this? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of their sins. He's still talking to the Jews. That's what Jesus came to do. Repentance to Israel and to give them a forgiveness of their sins. But we are his witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. On that same page that I gave you in your packet that has Deuteronomy, you'll see that I gave you a copy of John 15. If you look down at the bottom of it, it's when Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, When the advocate or the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, here you go, the Holy Spirit, will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So Jesus told them, you are going to testify about me, and the Holy Spirit is going to testify about me. He promised them that that would happen. Now look what he says right here in verse 32. We are his witnesses. We are testifying about him, and so is the Holy Spirit. It's happening just the way Jesus had told them back in John 15 that it was going to happen, and so that promise is being fulfilled. Okay, Gamaliel's advice. Now, when they heard this, they were furious, and they plotted to kill him. But unfortunately for them, there's no death penalty for disobeying the law. So they're trying to figure out what they could do to kill him. All right, so now we're in verse 34. We're in verse 34. One of the council stood up. He's a Pharisee, so he believes in the entirety of the Old Testament, named Gamaliel. He's a teacher of the law held in respect by all of the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Let me tell you just a little bit about Gamaliel. Gamaliel is uh, well documented in Jewish history, not just biblical, not just in our Bible, but in Jewish history. He was uh, one of the seven r rabbis of Judaism who was given the name of Rabbon, which means, the, uh, uh, which means our teacher. There were only seven rabbis in Jewish history given that name. It's an honoring name, Rabban. And so um, he was only, he was one of seven. He was uh, he, the leader of the most important school in Judaism, the school of Hillel. And that was the most important school going on at the time. He's the leader of that. He's a very well-respected, educated Pharisee who knows everything there is to know about Pharisaic law and is wise beyond your, his years. Do you know who his most famous student was? Paul. Paul was tutored and taught by Gamaliel. He's the most famous student that he has. When Paul says, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees, he was taught by the head Pharisee of the head school in all of Jerusalem at the time. So he's a, he's a very well-educated man. And he says to them in verse 35, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. And then he gives them some background history that I'm not going to go into detail. These are things that have happened in the past some time ago, Thaddeus rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him, and he was slain. And all of those who obeyed him were scattered. It came to nothing. Okay, so the same thing has happened before. And so in 37, he says, and after this, 
Judas, uh, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away many people with him. And he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So now I'm going to say to you, keep away from these men and leave them alone. For if this is the plan, um, for if this plan or is the work of men, it will come to nothing. It'll be just like what I just, the ones, I, the examples I just gave you. It's going to come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Is this wise counsel? It really is, isn't it? It is very wise counsel, however, it is not biblical truth. But it's very wise counsel. The reason why I say it's not biblical truth is because there are many things throughout history that have not been of God that have, pers that have persisted. Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, different religions, that are some of our religions today that are really off base and don't see Jesus as Messiah. And that they still continue on, and they will still continue on. So biblically, Satan does, is able to have some success in the world and throughout history. However, this is very wise counsel because you do not want to fight against God. And so he's recommending that that's what they do. So they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, notice how that's just kind of thrown in there. They had beaten them. They commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So I gave you a picture of uh, what the, uh, something similar to what they would use in your packet uh, to, to beat them with. They would have been flogged. They would have gotten what is called the, the uh, 40 lashes, but it's not 40 lashes because they only gave them 39. And the reason they gave them 39 is because if you by accident miscounted and went to 41, you would then have broken the law. And so then the person who was giving the beating could have been held accountable. So they, they purposely go to 39 so that you never break the law. That's great Pharisaic thinking. That's the way they always thought of everything. And, um, and so they would have gotten 39. They, get, uh, they would have gotten um, 13 to the chest, 13 to each shoulder and back area uh, with a whip that had multiple strands on it. Now the Roman one, the one that Jesus got be beaten with was far worse because they attached pieces of glass and bone and metal that tore strips of flesh off. The, Jew, the Jews did not use that. They used metal, uh, uh, just these, these um, type here, corded ones, that they beat them with. And they would have given them the 39 stripes. Uh, and that comes from Deuteronomy 25 when it talks about how you can, um, you can give them up to 40 lashes for what it is that they get. Uh, we're going to find out Paul gets this beating five times in the book of Acts. Five times he's beaten 39 whippings and beaten with rods and other things. But 30, 39 stripes, five times. Can you imagine the scars on your body, what you would have there? So in 41, it says they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Okay, they're bloody. They're a mess. And they're rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ or Jesus as the Messiah. So it didn't stop them at all. All right. Does anybody have a question? 